one of the things that when I, ha when I have a day off, uh, one of the things I like doing, I'm, I have to confess that I'm probably not the most productive on my days off. Uh, you know, if you look at our backyard, uh, you can see that we could probably use a little extra work in our backyard. So we mow the front yard just to kind of keep up appearances. But So I, I kind of relax by watching television shows, and one of my favorite television shows that I've enjoyed watching over the years was a TV show called American Pickers. How many have seen American Pickers? So if you've, if you've seen it, you know a little bit about the backstory. You know, it's um, Tom Wolf or Mike Wolf is the... Um, is basically the main guy in there and he and for a while his close friend Frank Fritz they would drive around the country and they would try and find these rare and valuable items kind of stock up and there are two antique stores one in Iowa and one in Nashville and I remember one time they they actually did a they came through Oregon one time and we saw we watched the episode and they stopped by and they were buying a motorcycle among other things and it's like Karen and I were looking at it. It's like, wait a minute, we reckon that was just down the street from us. It was literally what we would walk by the place. But if you watch that, you notice some of the places that they go, that they go to, is just there. People collect stuff. I mean, you open up a garage door, and I don't know how people put stuff in or even know what's in there. But there's stuff that's all the way up to garage doors. You get people who have literally barns and shops and just chock full of stuff. They go to places and, you know, you've got fields that have these old cars and old parts from carnivals. I mean, it's just some of the craziest stuff you see. You're just reminded of how much stuff there is, stuff that's just sitting there for you know, just accumulating all of this stuff over and over and over again. And the show just, it just never ceased to amaze me how much stuff there is out there. Well, for the last few months, we've been in Ecclesiastes, working our way through Ecclesiastes. And there are scholars who would disagree with me on this, people smarter than I, but I'm convinced that this is a book written by King Solomon toward the end of his life as he's processing all of the stuff that he's experienced. And this book that we've been in since March, it falls in the category of wisdom literature. It falls in the category of books like Job and Song of Solomon. But it's a book that really looks at wisdom. And wisdom is not absolute promises, but wisdom is truisms. It's things, as a general rule, these things are true. Are there exceptions? Sure. But these are truisms. These are statements that are general rules. The foundation of wisdom is the ability to honestly assess and interact with the world. Proverbs generally approaches things from the perspective of this is what you should do in order to live well in this world. Ecclesiastes, however, takes a little bit different approach. It assesses life as it is. Solomon demonstrates the futility and emptiness of living life simply from, the, from a human perspective. But he also illustrates for us what life should be from God's perspective. This is an effort that I've defined as kind of a fool's errand, which is the title of our series. And what Solomon teaches us through the book of Ecclesiastes is that the pursuit of wisdom without the pursuit of God is a pointless and painful proposition. And we've seen that over the last few weeks that we've been in this book. This morning we are coming to, our, to the next to the last sermon in this series. So next week we will be pausing the series. We'll finish up with chapter 6. We'll take a break from Ecclesiastes. 
And the plan right now is to resume chapter seven after the first of the year. A little bit of a break here. And so we'll be going into, if you want to get a head start on the reading for the next series, we will be in the Psalms, specifically Psalms 139 through 141. So if you want to start reading through those, we'll be focusing on prayer for the month of June. As I mentioned before, this series is has been a bit repetitive. There are themes that just keep coming up over and over and over again. Solomon hits the same issues and the same ideas, and this is no, long, no less the case this morning, as we will be covering a topic that we touched on last week. And so some of the same ideas will be heard again this morning. As with much of wisdom literature, this morning's text is a study in contrast. We will see a demonstration of a painful approach to an issue contrasted with a pleasant approach to the same issue. Together, these illustrate how we should view this particular issue. Last week, we, saw, we looked at the cost of relentlessly pursuing things in contrast to the contentment of resting in the things that one has. Today, we look at the possession of possessions as the title of my sermon this morning. And the lesson that we see is this, the manner in which we manage our possessions makes them either painful or pleasant. The manner in which we manage our positions makes them either painful or pleasant. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter five, and my text this morning is Ecclesiastes chapter five, verses 13 through 20. Ecclesiastes chapter five, verses 13 through 20, this is what Solomon writes. There's a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a, a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will, come, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil, exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life, he eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Here's what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in your mercy, in your sovereignty, you've given us the revelation of your truth in your word. We thank you even through the life of a man like Solomon, whose life did not end well in terms of its honoring you, we're still reminded of the wisdom that you've given us to guide us as we seek to navigate the world as it is. I pray that you would open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts to receive the truth that you desire for us to have this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It was... Drawing on sundown, when I met a stout, dark, sour-looking woman coming, trudging down a hill, and she, when I had my usual question, turned 
turned sharp about, accompanying, accompanied me back to the summit she had just left and pointed to a great bulk of building standing very bare on a green in the bottom of the next valley. The country was pleasant roundabout, running in low hills, pleasantly watered and wooded, and the, and the crops, to my eyes, wonderfully good, but the house itself appeared to be a kind of to be a kind of ruin. No road led to it, no smoke arose from the chimneys, nor was there any semblance of garden. My heart sank. That, I cried. The woman's face lit up with a malignant anger. That is the house of Shaw's, she cried. Blood built it, blood stopped the building of it, blood shall bring it down. See here, she cried again. I spit on the ground. I crack my thumb at it. Black be its fall. If ye see the laird, tell him what ye hear. Tell him this makes the 1219 time that Janet Clouston has called down the curse on him and his house. Buyer and stable, man, guest, and master, wife, miss, and bairn, Black, black be their fall. And the woman whose voice had risen to a kind of eldritch sing-song turned on a skip and was gone. I stood where she left me with my hair on end. In those days, folks still believed in witches and trembled at a curse. This one spat, falling so pat like a wayside omen to arrest me ere I carried out my purpose, took the pith out of my legs. I sat me down and stared at the house of Shaw's. And the more I looked, the pleasanter the countryside appeared, being all set with hawthorn bushes full of flower, fields dotted with sheep, a fine flight of rooks in the sky, and every sign of kind soil and climate. And the barracks in the midst of it soar against my fancy. This is what, this is the description from the novel Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson of the House of Shahs that David Balfour looks on. An apt description, I think, I, don't, I have no way of knowing for sure, but I, would, I could imagine maybe Stevenson thinking of our passage this morning as he's describing this scene. Solomon sees something in our text that he describes as a grievous evil. The Christian Standard Bible accurately translates this phrase as, quote, a sickening tragedy. What is taking place is not so much a moral evil in the sense of a sin, although it might be that too. What is happening here is rather something that is akin to a disaster. He's witnessing a disaster here. The man has lost sight of the reason that we have Wealth, the reason God has given us wealth. The first point from our text is this the improper perspective on possession leads to a great grief. The improper perspective on possessions leads to a great grief. We see this in our text in a couple of ways. Notice first, foolish this foolish focus leaves nothing behind this foolish focus on possessions leaves nothing behind look at the situation again verses 13 and 14 we see this is a grievous evil which i have seen under the sun riches being hoarded by their own by their owner to his hurt when those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son then there was nothing to support him what a tragic situation. What we see here is a man gathering and gathering and gathering stuff. His house is increasingly full. Soon 
he turns he turns to his barns and his outbuildings, adding more and more stuff. Gain, acquire, purchase, store, hoard, invest, 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 all for the accumulation of things. More wealth, more possessions is the picture that we see here. Back in chapter 2, we see Solomon describing himself in a very similar way. Solomon seeking to increase his possessions. He describes his enlarged works, how he built houses and planted gardens and vineyards and orchards. He had male and female servants. His businesses were booming. He was a man defined by the abundance of riches. In our text, we see a man who is willing to risk everything in order to gain more wealth and more riches. So with this in mind, he takes one more risk, one more gamble in order to try and get a little bit more. The higher the stakes, the greater the reward, so he has one last gamble. Only this time the gamble doesn't pay off. This time he loses everything. What the man lost sight of is that the things that we have are not for our benefit alone. The things that we possess are not for our benefit alone. Solomon writes in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children and the wealth of sinners is stored up for the righteous. The foolish focus on possessions sees the acquisition of things merely for personal gain. It's all about me. It does not take into consideration the welfare of others, particularly the generations that come afterward. Now, lest we think that this is just the exclusive realm of the rich and greedy, consider our church. We're a small church, and perhaps we don't think of ourselves as particularly rich or having a lot in the way of possessions. There are churches bigger than ours. There are churches that have more than we do. But what do we possess in the way of spiritual gifts that God has given us? What do we have? Do we know the gospel? Do we possess an accurate understanding of the gospel, the greatest of all riches? What are we doing with the spiritual riches that God has given to us in abundance? How much of the spiritual wealth are we hoarding to our own hurt. We're keeping it to ourselves. How much of it are we keeping from the generations that are coming behind us? Are we actively seeking to invest in preparing a place for Leo and Lucas, for Isaac, Gracie, Eli, and Ellie? for Paxton and Bowden to receive the benefit of what God has given to us and where they learn to pass along those same treasures to yet other generations. Foolish focus on possessions, whatever they might be, whether physical or spiritual, that foolish focus on hoarding to our own hurt leaves nothing behind for future generations. Why is it that churches so often get old and die? Because we've lost focus on the the truth that the things that God has given us are for the benefit of yet other generations. So this foolish focus leaves nothing behind. We see this in proper perspective in still another way. This foolish focus gains nothing in the end. There is no benefit in the end. Look at verses 15 to 17. As he had come from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. 
He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who toils in the wind? Or toils for the wind. Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Fairly early on in our marriage, Karen and I discovered that we couldn't have kids. We discovered that. Before we found out that we would not be able, that before we found out this, we had, we had talked about, you know, what would it be like if Karen happened to get pregnant? Karen goes to the hospital and, you know, there are guys who, guys who want to be there when their wives are having Maybe there's the guy who wants to be there to catch the baby when the baby comes out uh, using their video cameras or today your smartphones. You got to record the whole thing. So there are guys who do that. There's probably the guy who passes out on the floor in the, in the delivery room. Well, I didn't want to be that guy. Uh, to be honest with you, the whole process, it, it has no fascination to me whatsoever. So I was convinced I'm going to be the nervous dad in the waiting room, pacing back and forth. Karen wasn't particularly thrilled with that idea. She would want me there, I understand. But to be honest with you, I just, I didn't have the stomach for what was, I didn't want to be the guy who was passed out on the floor. What I can tell you, though, is when a baby is born, what does the baby have? Absolutely nothing. The baby doesn't even have any clothes on. No clothes, no diaper, no food, no nothing. Everything has to be provided for the baby. Perhaps the thing that's absent the most is probably the one thing that most parents would want, particularly if you're a first-time parent and that is an instruction manual. You know, here's, here's your instruction manual for how to raise this little, what Vodi Bakum calls a viper in diapers. How do you raise this, this new thing? Each of us comes into the world with nothing. We come into the world with absolutely nothing. What we often fail to realize in our corrupted view of our possessions is that we're going to leave the world precisely the same way. We come into the world with nothing, we're leaving the world with nothing. Oh, I'm sure that when we die, if we're buried in a casket, our loved ones will want to dress us up in some way, and so you might argue, well, at least you're taking the clothes that are going to be in the casket. In reality, nothing, we have nothing when we die. We accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and all of this accumulation is to our own hurt and when we fail to realize the nature of our time here on earth. In Stevenson's book, Kidnapped, David Balfour arrives at the house of Shaz, where he finds his uncle Ebenezer living a very miserly existence. And he describes his meeting with his uncle this way. He says, go into the kitchen and touch nothing. I'm not going to try and do the Scottish accent. Uh, for those who want to hear the Scottish accent, watch the Disney movie. And while, as he goes on to say, and while the person of the house set himself to replacing the defenses on the door. I groped forward and entered the kitchen. The fire had burned fairly bright and showed me the barest room I had ever laid my eyes on. Half a dozen dishes stood upon the shelves. The table was laid for supper with a bowl of porridge, a horn spoon, and a, and a cup of small beer. Besides what I named, there was not another thing in that great stone vaulted empty chamber, but locked fast chests arranged along the wall and a corner cupboard 
with a padlock. Solomon describes the man who hoarded his possessions saying, throughout his life he also eats in darkness with vexation, sickness, and anger. What is there to gain by hoarding possessions? What is there? What do we gain? In focusing on possessions as ends in themselves. What we gain is depression and despair and anger. We gain nothing that truly satisfies and much that doesn't. Consider what Jesus says, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. This is what Jesus says, ironically, on the heels of Peter's confession. Jesus has just chastised Peter. And then he says this, he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Then he says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? For what will a man gain in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus says, that What is a prophet of man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? The foolish focus on riches leaves nothing behind and it gains nothing in the end. The improper perspective on possessions leads to a great grief. So if we have seen this improper perspective on possessions, what is, what is the flip side? What is the proper possession of proper perspective on possessions. Job says at the outset of his trials that God was leading him through, he says, naked I came into my mother's, came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So what is this proper perspective on possessions? The proper perspective on possessions leads to a great gift we see. We see this in verses 18 to 20. Here I have seen, here is what I have seen to be good. We've seen what is to be bad. Here I've seen what is seen, here I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor which in which he toils under the sun during the during the few years of life which God has given him. For this is his reward. Furthermore, I have seen as for furthermore as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. What we see from our text is that the right way to view our possessions, ironically, is not to focus on them at all. The benefit of our possessions is not in the gaining of them or the losing of them. There is no inherent benefit either in being rich or in being poor. Neither is an inherent blessing or a curse. So what is our proper focus to be with regard to possessions? And these three verses, there are at least two things, two that are inseparably woven together in our text. The first is that we see this faithful focus enjoys what has been earned. 
this faithful focus enjoys what has been earned. We see this in verse 18. Verse 18 says, here I have seen, here's what I've seen to be good and fitting to eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of life which God has given him. We are to labor. We are to work. We are to be productive. We are to earn, but we are not to do so for the purpose of hoarding possessions. We are to work so that we can enjoy what our hands have earned. Throughout church history, there has been this ideology that has popped up at various times. It's an ideology, it's, a, it's an ideology called asceticism. Asceticism is defined this way. It's the teaching that Spirituality is attained through the renunciation of physical pleasures and personal desires while concentrating on spiritual matters. There are people who take this to an extreme. It can be as simple as just fasting from time to time, or people take it to extreme fasting or engaging in bland diets. They wear plain, old or extremely worn clothing. They choose to dwell in austere conditions like caves, sleeping on hard, cold surfaces. People take this to an extreme. In this, it is this particular practice that Paul criticizes and corrects in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul tells Timothy this, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, and he goes on to say, men who forbid marriage, who advocate abstaining from food which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word and prayer. We've been given food to eat, not simply to gain strength to engage in work, but because the food itself is meant to be enjoyed. There is nothing inherently wrong with enjoying a good steak or a hamburger or a good cheesecake dessert, although my stomach anymore doesn't particularly like that one. There's nothing inherently wrong with enjoying foods. Let me say something else here. Now, this may this is a little bit more acceptable today than it probably would have been 20 or 30 years ago. There isn't even anything inherently wrong with the consumption of alcohol. There's, alcohol itself is not wrong. It's perfectly fine to enjoy a glass of wine or a mug of beer. Scripture does not prohibit the consumption of alcohol. Now there's important caveat here. I don't drink, never have, surprised, surprised my soldiers as a chaplain that I never have. The consumption of alcohol is not wrong. The abuse of alcohol is. The same is true with the eating of food, although we seldom talk about that. Eat food, enjoy food, don't abuse it. It's okay to drink alcohol in moderation, don't abuse it. When we focus on the thing itself, when we make that our pursuit, then 
we've lost our focus and we have swerved into sinful territory. We make the pursuit of the thing itself we have sinned. We must guard ourselves from overcorrecting, however, and making the abuse of a liberty the cause for the denial of the liberty. The proper perspective on possessions leads to a great gift, and this focus, first of all, enjoys what has been earned. The second focus is the most important focus, and that is this focus embraces what God has given. Verse 18 speaks of eating and drinking and enjoying oneself as things that are to be good and fitting, but man can only do so because of the few years of his life which God has given him. In verse 19, Solomon continues, furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he, that is God, has also empowered him, that is man, to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. What we possess, all that we possess, everything that we possess, is the result of what God has done. This is an illustration of what we might call common grace. Common grace, one dictionary defines common grace this way. Common grace speaks of God's extension of his favor to all people through providential care, regardless of whether or not they acknowledge and love God. Wayne Grudem says this, we may define common grace as follows. Common grace is the grace of God by which he gives people innumerable blessings that are not part of salvation. The word common here comes or means something that is common to all people and is not restricted to, belie to believers or to the elect only, unquote. There's a common grace in enjoying what God has given. Why is it that the sinner and the saved can look at a beautiful sunset and be equally be enthralled with it? How is it that the righteous and unrighteous can watch a baseball game and be amazed at how people can take something so challenging and make it look so easy. How come a good cup of coffee the first thing in the morning is just as, is just as enjoyable to an atheist as it is to a pastor? Why is it? Why is it that we can enjoy all of these things? Each one of these things exists because God is demonstrating in a general and generous sense his own grace toward every person everywhere. God is demonstrating his grace. He has created humanity in his own image and before the fall he placed humanity in a garden where they had every need provided for them. Every tree except for one God gave to man to enjoy, we see in Genesis. When God gave woman to man, even this act had an enjoyment component to it. The relationship was meant to be an enjoyable relationship. When sin entered the world through Adam's disobedience, the world itself became corrupted and subject to futility, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, 19 to 21, he says, For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for creation itself was subjected to futility, not willingly, because but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. One of the reasons why we don't enjoy things is we don't acknowledge that they come from God. 
and that this world has been corrupted by sin. In the midst of this futility, there is still an element of God's common grace that pervades life. We can enjoy the laughter of a child, the babbling of a brook, the meal with friends and family like we did yesterday. We can enjoy a warm campfire and when you're out in a place where you can see it well, billions of stars that light up the night sky. All of this because God has sovereignly chosen to display his grace in ordinary and universal ways to all of humanity. When we gaze on God's goodness, when we focus on his faithfulness, when our eyes are directed away from the futility that life can become, we do so because in doing that, we become, and when we do that, we become occupied with the good things that are, our, that are at our disposal. The proper perspective on possessions leads to a great gift. It is this gift whose focus enjoys what has been earned and embraces what God has given. If there was one person that I would go to who would demonstrate this important perspective on possessions, the person we've already heard from this morning, it would be the Apostle Paul. In his letter to the Philippians, he tells the believers there in Philippi of all of the things in which he could boast. He talks about his background, how he was circumcised on the eighth day. He refers to his purity, his cultural purity, how he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He speaks of his excellent education as a Pharisee. He talks about how he was perfect with regard to the ceremonial law. However, he describes all of these things to be rubbish compared to knowing Christ. As, we, as he begins to conclude his letter, he speaks with praise of the Philippians, concern for him. He'd been going through much, and he speaks of them rekindling their concern for him. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. As we conclude this morning, I want to read a section from Philippians chapter 4. Well-known section to most, most of us, certainly two verses in here. Philippians 4, beginning in verse 10, this is what Paul writes to these believers. He says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you had revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to, get along, how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. So often we like to focus on verses 11 and 13. Those are the ones that pop up. I, those of you who have heard me, I can go off on a rant a little bit about the problems of chapter and verse breaks. We like to focus on 11 and 13, but when we do, we really miss the true message that Paul is seeking to communicate when you read these verses in their context. Paul is appreciative of these believers' concern for his welfare. Not that he really feels like he needs anything, but there's an opportunity there. He's not wanting anything from them, but his need has given these believers an opportunity to demonstrate godly concern. In the midst of all of this, 
Paul expresses great contentment that transcends his circumstances. He's looking at all of these things. And he says that he has learned contentment. This demonstrates that contentment is not something that comes naturally. It is a skill to be developed. We are not naturally contented people. We are naturally selfish people. We are naturally the hoarders. We're not naturally those who are contented. We are naturally selfish and self-serving people. We are people who think of ourselves first. As the people of God, we must learn contentment in the context of all circumstances, whether we have abundance or scarcity, whether we are full or whether we are hungry. We must learn to be content whether our bank account is bulging or bare. We learn contentment by gaining a proper perspective on our possessions. We learn contentment when we realize that the improper perspective on our possessions leads to a grief that leaves nothing behind and gains nothing in the end. We learn contentment when we understand the proper perspective of possessions leads to a great gift that enjoys what has been earned and embraces what God has given. We must come to understand that the manner in which we manage our possessions makes them either painful or pleasant. And the only way we can see them as pleasant is if we realize that they come from the hand of God alone. How do we how do we learn this? On our own, we can't come to this conclusion. But my favorite two word phrase in all of Scripture, but God. God who comes and transforms the selfish heart. He redeems us so that we can acknowledge him and worship him as we were created to be. Not only do we embrace the common grace of God, but we can embrace the particular grace of God that's demonstrated through Christ's life and death on the cross. We embrace this through faith alone because of the grace of God alone and to the glory of God alone. And when we do so, we can understand that the proper perspective on possessions leads to a great gift. And in that way, we can learn truly to be content. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift as your servant James reminds us of. We thank you that no good thing will you withhold from those who walk uprightly. God, I pray that we would not be possessed by our possessions, but that we would learn to focus on you and yet also to enjoy the things that you have given us. May we be people who are truly contented. May we live in a world that is selfish as people who demonstrate selflessness. In the midst of this, I pray that you would open up opportunities for us to give a reason for the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect, knowing that we have everything from your hand. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.